and welcome to another episode of Uva. This week we are going to talk about Dynamo and for that I have an amazing guest, Alex Dibri. He is the author of the book The Dynamo DB Book and we are going to work together through an Instagram clone application and apply the best practices of DynamoDB. So let's get to the video. Hello and welcome to another episode. Today I have a super special guest. He is one of the DynamoDB gurus. Uh, he's an AWS data hero and the author of the most popular Dynamo book out there. I'm pretty sure you all know who he is. I have with me Alex DeVry. So welcome, Alex. How are you doing? Thank you. Thanks for having me. I, I'm, I'm doing well. Great to be here. Excited uh, excited to make my debut on, on your channel. I've been watching your stuff for yeah. a while. So Yeah, I'm super excited to have you here because Dynamo is one of my favorite services. So I have Rick last year and now I'm bringing you here to speak. Next time I should make a debate. Yep, exactly. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah, so what have you have been doing lately? Yeah, I've just been doing, um, you know, talks and promotion and things for, for the book and then also consulting, um, you know, with different clients, either DynamoDB specifically or, or more AWS and, and serverless type stuff, it's sort of anything in that realm Been working with clients that way. So, uh, yeah, it's been it's been fun getting exposure to a lot of different problems, working with a lot of different clients and doing some teaching and all that. So, yeah. Yeah, that's the nice thing of, of doing your own or your own thing. You can... <laughs> find your own way and yep, decide exactly. what to do. Yeah. But before being your own boss, you also work for the serverless framework for serverless Inc. And and I was looking that you work in these particular years where basically everything was kind of very boozy and, and, and hype about serverless from twenty seventeen to nineteen or something like that. You were there. How it felt to work in a company that was basically in the middle of the serverless explosion because by then it was the biggest framework yeah um it, it was just a lot of fun um you know <laughs> I, I loved working for a a company where like i was a user myself it felt like i was building for me but i was also helping build for for all these other developers and it was just cool to see like the way you can enable other people and the cool things they're building on top of that. So just like seeing all that was super interesting. And then also just seeing the community grow. I mean, that's how I, I sort of met and, and found you and, and folks like Jeremy Daly and, and all the mm -hmm. great, you know, DAs at, at AWS. And it was just like a really fun time to, to see the community grow. And like, it was so new. So we were still figuring out all the patterns and, and yeah, yeah, it was just a, it was a really fun time for sure. That's the, the most interesting thing because basically at least when I started with serverless in two, 2016 nobody really knew what you could do i don't think even aws have a clue what like what was the power of this uh and everybody was like coming with new ideas and, and new ways of using it so i imagine as a service provider a framework provider it was kind of interesting to catch up with all the <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah, yeah so, so yeah so much energy going on at that time so it was a lot of fun yeah so Today, what we are going to talk, if you have not imagined, we are going to be talking about Dynamo, <laughs> aren't we? Yes, and I think we are going to take it in a different way, like it's not going to be a class on Dynamo. I want to take it to on, on good practices and try to pick your brain on, on, on how to do things. And, and you suggested when we were preparing for do, this to do and um, build an application and, and go from there. And I think that's something the audience will love because they love to see code. <laughs> so, so maybe we can start from there. Why, why Dynamo? Yeah, why Dynamo? I think, um, you know, you see a lot of folks, especially in the in the serverless world in the last, you know, uh, three or four years, picking up Dynamo and choosing Dynamo for a number of different reasons. And, and I think probably the biggest one that was that people were choosing was was the connection model where people were trying to use relational database. But when you had this this hyper ephemeral compute with with Lambda and you have Lambda spinning up all over the place, and you have the VPC cold start, it just like you know, in connection limits to relational databases, it just, uh, it was problematic to use relational databases in Lambda. So then you saw people reach for Dynamo because of the way it has that HTTP connection model and doesn't have connection limits yeah. and networking stuff. That's why we all started using it, it, Dynamo. It, it truly was. And then, you know, for a long time, you know, I myself and, and a lot of people were just like using Dynamo 
poorly and like getting frustrated with it and things like that. And then, um, you know, I found Rick Houlihan stuff and, and went deep <laughs> on it. it and... Your mind exploded. Exactly. Yeah. And then I had to just like <laughs> slowly piece it back together. All the pieces I found all over my, my room. But, um, uh, yeah, you know, Rick, uh, doing an awesome job teaching, teaching the world how to dynamo. And I think it's just been fun to, to see the community grow and, and things like that. So. Yeah, but I think that's that's a good thing to say that we were doing Dynamo wrong because I remember when I got started with Dynamo, I think I rewrote my databases like 20 times. I was putting, we were doing a migration from basically a Postgres database to Dynamo because we were moving to serverless and it was so hard to find how to make the data fit in there and how to use the access patterns. I, I was <laughs> such, a, such a pain uh, when you don't know what you were doing because I I never got to study Dynamo. By that time, I was like, ah, I can throw everything into it. Yep. It's, it's true. And I think, yeah, just the content out there on NoSQL, you know, it, it used to be just kind of so bad and just, yeah. Um, I think it's gotten a lot better over the last uh, couple of years. And, and Rick and the AWS team have been a huge part of that. So um, Yeah, and I think all, all the community as well, because yeah. like, because serverless people started using it more and more, and it's not just the big organizations that were using this NoSQL for their things. It was just also normal companies, normal sizes that just wanted to take advantage of it. And then they were like, oh, maybe we need to write better documents and more blog posts and <laughs> all these type of things. So, yeah. Cool. Yeah, absolutely. It, and it just sort of exploded from there. So yeah, it's been it's been fun to watch. So where do you want to start with this application? What cool. You want yeah. To... I, so first of all, I want to start off with just a little bit of background on Dynamo, and I'll share some slides for this. Um, gonna keep it fun, keep it visual, hopefully. And two things I want to show, I want to talk about. Number one is is a little more concepts around Dynamo, especially around why, why choosing Dynamo. You know, we talked about the serverless aspect, but there's another aspect around consistency of performance that I like to talk about that's interesting. And then we'll just talk about some basic concepts in Dynamo, um, some of the terminology and, and, and what this single table design stuff is, just so we you know, lay a little foundation because some of the stuff we'll do later, I don't want you to, to, to feel like it's way over your head. So this is like the, the crash course, 100, 200 level stuff, and then we'll, we'll go to the higher level stuff. So uh, starting off here with the slides, uh, one thing I like to show people is uh, just kind of compare relational databases to Dynamo in in terms of consistency of performance. I like to start off with this little chart, and on the x-axis there, I have data size, right? And as you go further out on that x-axis, you have more and more data in your application. So maybe this is years down the road as your as your data grows, you you keep moving to the right. And then on the left side, you have performance, and you can think about this as as sort of latency, right? So lower is better. You have blazing fast, and then fast, sluggish, and and, and up to painful, you know. And if you're working with a relational database, you might see a curve sort of like this, right? Where in your test environment or the first day you launch, you have a little bit of data, everything fits in memory, it's super fast, you're, you're working really well, you're, you're very happy with that. But then, you know, six months, a year, two years down the road, you get more data, you get more users. It starts to get sluggish, users are complaining, you have to do some investigation, do I need to denormalize, do I need to add more indexes, do I need to increase my instance size, stuff like that. And then at some point, you know, it might get so sluggish and, and, and beyond sluggish, even to painful, that you need to re-architect your application. So you sort of see a performance curve like that often with relational databases. Um, and then in contrast with DynamoDB, you're going to see a performance curve more like this, right, where it's completely flat. And, and two things I want to call out there. Number one, on the far left side of that that curve, you know, a relational database might be faster at that very, very low end of data. Um, but Dynamo is generally fast enough that your users aren't going to really notice it, so it's not a huge deal there. I think the bigger difference is just how that it's going to be consistently fast throughout. So like in your test environment or on day one, it's going to perform the same as down the road, you know, five years later. And I think that terabyte. that's super important because yeah. we are all building global applications and we are all collecting all the data in the world and like... <laughs> yep. Exactly. It's, and it's, it's nice to know that, you know, you can like develop this thing and then just sort of set it on autopilot forever and you don't have this long-term drag of like going back to that application, you know, figuring out what's going on, per performance, debugging, things like that. You can just sort of move on to new things. So uh, that's what I really love about Dynamo. I think that that aspect is overrated or underrated in terms of that consistency of performance. So uh, I think that's a big thing um, for users. So that's another reason why to choose Dynamo. Uh, and then just moving on to, to some concepts around Dynamo. 
Here's some data that you might see in Dynamo. This is all modeled with NoSQL Workbench, which you can pick up. This is an AWS tool. Uh, basically, I got some some users in my table here. In terms of terminology, right? If I look at an individual record there, I've outlined it in red. That's gonna be an item. So this one happens to be myself, Alex Bree. You can also see we got uh, you, Marcia. We've got Rick Houlihan in there. So a couple different users in our table. So that's one item there. Um, I want to split that item into to two parts. You have the primary key there over on the left, and that primary key is going to be um, declared on your table. Every single item in your table needs to have that primary key, and that's how you're going to access your data. So in this case, you're going to access your data by the organization name that they work for and the, and the username, something like that. Yeah. Um, and they need to be unique, this combination. Exactly. And yeah. I think that sometimes is, is confusing. <laughs> yep, yep, good point. So you need to uniquely identify each item with that primary key. So that primary key in Dynamo, super important. Make sure you kind of understand the concepts there. In addition to that primary key, you also have these other attributes there on the right. Those are things like name, email, I put favorite AWS region, whatever you want to put there. Um, those are things you're not going to query by. They're just sort of going to come along for the ride when you fetch that, that user. So in this case, you know, we'll fetch the user by their username and who they work for, but, but not by their first name or their email or their favorite region, things like that. So th those other attributes, you just think of those as, as other things. Those aren't indexed uh, necessarily uh, with Dynamo. So, that's a basic example. I also want to move into or talk a little bit about what we call single table design because that, that really blows people's minds. So, um, you know, this has just users in a table, but um, what we're going to be building later today is sort of like an Instagram clone, right? And we have users and we have photos and we have likes on photos, we have comments on photos, we have followers, things like that. Uh, so, I'll, I'll just show a quick example of part of what that table will look like. Um, so here is a table with some single table design. Uh, it looks a little um, more confusing than our last one, but if you look at this, you can see I have two user items in this table, and I and I have a type attribute that's identifying, hey, this is a user item. So again, I have I have both of us. I have myself, and I have you, Marcia. Um, in addition to that, I have a couple photo items. Those are outlined in blue there. You can see the type is, is photo for those ones. So they're all in the same table there. So. But if they're all on the same table, it's, it's kind of confusing how we use the primary key for that sort of thing. Right? My, my question is why you will put everything in one table? Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a good point. Um, a couple different reasons. Number one, um, there are no joins in DynamoDB. So if you ever want to get sort of different types of entities in a single request, like you would in a join operation in a relational database, you'll need to put those in the same table and in the same what's called item collection, which has the same partition key. And you can get those um, very efficiently in a single request to, to handle that sort of thing. So that's one reason to put them together. Another reason, um, especially before DynamoDB had on-demand mode, is it just makes it sort of easier to maintain operations around that table where you only need to sort of configure provision capacity for one table, not for all your different separate tables. Um, you could just sort of do one and, and handle it that way. And we need to monitor alerts and alarms on one table as well. Now that Dynamo has on-demand mode, if you're using on-demand, that's not quite as important. Um, you, you can have these different tables with on-demand mode, and it's still pretty easy to handle those. Um, the, the last thing I like about single table is it really forces you to think in Dynamo DB terms, I think, and it makes you think access patterns first. It makes you it makes you think about these sort of generic primary keys. I'm going to talk about in just a sec. To where you're like, okay, I split my item into these two parts: the primary key, which is how I access my data. That's those are my indexing attributes in Dynamo, and then I have my actual application attributes. You know, like the username, name, things like that that we talk about that I actually use in my application. And you think of those separately. One is for Dynamo only and one is for your application and and it just helps you think about that data in a more generic way and gets yeah. you into because that if, if you see in this example the username you have it in your partition key and you again have it as an attribute so it's very clear that one is for dynamo and one is for your application yep absolutely so it's not that you will get your partition key and then you will parse it in your application to extract the username no they're independent use yep. cases. Yep, absolutely. And that's that's a recommendation I do to have those separately. Some people like to parse it out of their partition key, but I'm just like, hey, keep all that stuff separate. Think of this as one way and think of that the other way. And um, But it's up to you. A um, couple other points I want to call out here. So if we look at that primary key, you know, I used to have organization name and username for the partition key and my sort key. But if you look now, I have these very generic names for my primary key. So the partition key element is just called PK, that stands for partition key. The sort key element is SK, that stands for sort key. So again, because I have these different items that aren't gonna sh share the same attributes, I'm gonna use these generic attributes there. We're not gonna go deep into what partition key and sort key are, but um, 
that's how that generic attributes work. Um, and then if you look at the values for these, you know, look at the value for that partition key. It for the user item, it's it starts with user, so capitalize user hash, and then the the username in there. And that's gonna be the same pattern for for both sort of users that I'm having there. But then if you look at you know the the photo item, I have a different one. I have u photo for user photo, and then hash, and then the the username, which is gonna be that owning user. That's gonna allow me to get all the photos for a particular user uh, very easily. So this is just like some very basic stuff. Um, you don't have to understand all this right now. We'll talk a little bit more about some of this later on and also just check out you know other material or the AWS docs but that's a little bit of how sort of single table design works with Dynamo and, and some of the concepts we'll see and then uh, yeah we can move on to actually working with our application yeah so next I want to talk about the um, how you go about modeling with Dynamo DB and sort of what the the um, uh, patterns are to do this and and um, I have some code on github you can check this out it's gonna be shared as, as part of this but yes um, for basically what we're building is is this Instagram cl clone right so here I have um, our code in in github that you can look at this dynamo DB Instagram and when you're modeling your data with Dynamo, the, the first thing you need to do, and this is true whether you have Dynamo or something else, is you really need to understand your application and understand what you're building, right? So I always recommend starting with some sort of design document saying what you're building and sort of walking through the different steps. But one of the big things I always like to have in a design document is what I call terms and concepts. And it just says, what are you building? And, and sort of what are the different terms and things we're talking about here? So um, I have a very basic and sort of simple one here since Instagram is what a lot of people know but you might have more details here but, you know I'm saying here I'm saying hey a user is, is something that is someone that signed up for our application they're uniquely identified by that username so you have that sort of constraint in there that unique I identity um, it talks about a photo right it's an image uploaded by a user um, photos can be liked or commented that we'll talk about below so we have likes as well you know a user can like a specific photo uh, a constraint that we have here is, you know, a specific photo can only be liked once by a particular user. So you don't want, you know, a user to be able to like a photo 15 or 20 times just so you get a bunch of likes on it, things like that. Uh, but then you have comments, right, where there's no limit to the number of comments on a photo by a given user. So likes and comments similar but different. So I think just like illustrate all this different stuff, what a follow is, you know, a follow is not bi-directional, it's a one-way relational, a one-way relationship. So just think about you know, just list some of those things out and really understand your application and what you're building and, and get that on the same page. Then someone reading the design doc says, okay, I can understand this stuff. And, and if you have a constraint in your terms that isn't reflected in your application, it's easy for them to comment and say, hey, how are you, how are you handling some of that stuff? So yeah, that's what I always- I think that's very yeah. good point. And I think we all have started to develop applications without really like having a clue in our head what we were doing, but really not thinking about the real access patterns. I think at least for me, a common example in the past is that I always try to implement it search. And when you realize it, most of applications don't have search in all the things. They might have search for one parameter, like you need to find something, but the rest of the attributes, and that's very hard to model in, in Dynamo, for example, full search in all the whole things like you can do with SQL. Uh, <laughs> so that's, I, I was my common mistake at the beginning, like, oh, I, I cannot model this thing. I need search, but then I didn't understand my access pattern. Yep. So. Yep, absolutely. And especially for like complex things like that, like search is just a hard thing to do, you know, definitely in Dynamo, but you know, any way you're doing it, it's a hard thing and a hard thing to scale. So understanding your constraints around search or your constraints around all these different things, I think is really going to help your, your modeling and how you go about that. So after I sort of have that and understand my terms and concepts, the, the next thing I recommend doing is, is thinking about your access patterns. And in Dynamo, you definitely want to think access patterns first. So, you know, once you've sort of listed out those terms and concepts, you go into access patterns. And I recommend listing out your access patterns in like a Google Sheet or something like this, where you're very detailed in it and actually list out every one you have. So you can see here, you know, I have basic user and photo CRUD. So create and, and read and update, delete for around user photos. But then things like, listing photos for a particular user, liking a photo, listing likes for a photo, comments, following a user, listing followers of users, all those different things. List out every single access pattern you have and then what you'll do is you'll sort of go through and design your table to handle these different access patterns. You'll design the primary keys and any secondary indexes you want to handle these access patterns. So this is what the blank version of it looks like and then the filled out version 
uh, is going to be something like this. You know, if I want to get photos for a particular user, I know that I want to go to my name main table. I'm going to need my username parameter, and I'm going to run the query operation. Or if I want to like a photo, right? I'm uh, again using that main table. I need these three different parameters, and I'm running a transaction. And we'll look at this transaction in a little bit. It has two different operations, right? Where we're incrementing this like counter on a photo, but we're also creating that like. Um, and ensuring uniqueness, right? Because we don't want a, a single user to like a photo more than one time. So all these different constraints, you have these access patterns listed out. And once you have this uh, listed out pretty in a, in a nice detailed way, then it's very easy for you to, to go out and actually implement this in your code. And actually most of the work you're gonna do with Dynamo is gonna be in charts like these rather than in your code. The code part of it is pretty uh, straightforward once you get that. Um, another thing you're going to have just as you work through this is what I call an entity chart. So, you know, I had those those five different terms and concepts. I had user, photo, like, comment, follower. List each of those entities, and as you're working through your, your access patterns and designing it, you're going to say, hey, what's the PK pattern? What's the SK pattern? You'll end up with something like this where you say, hey, my user, the PK pattern is going to be user, hash, and then the username, and, and same for the can SK. Can we go on what is the difference on a primary key and a sort key so people can understand what, what this means? Yep, sure. So um, so with DynamoDB, um, first of all, with when we're talking about a primary key, again, that's how you do drive most of your access patterns in DynamoDB, and there are two types of primary keys. The first is a simple primary key that has just a partition key. Don't use that very often because it only allows just key value type access patterns, so getting a single item uh, at, a, at, a, at a time. Um, the second type of primary key is what's called a composite primary key, and if you have more complex applications, that's what you're going to be using. And, and the composite primary key has two elements. It has a partition key, which we have as, as PK here, and then it has a sort key. And the way to think about this is partition key is sort of like a group by, right? So anything that has the same partition key is going to be grouped and, and next to each other um, in the database on the same partition. It's going to be very easy to, to retrieve items that have the same partition key. And then within items that have the same partition key, they will be ordered by that sort key. And that sort key is going to be a B tree, going to be very efficient to get that. You can sort of think of within a, a given partition key, uh, everything's ordered like a, a phone book or like a physical dictionary to where it's e very easy to get a particular word or say, hey, give me all the items between uh, D and F in the, in the dictionary, right? And it's very easy to sort of find that range of items and return them back to you. And that, that composite primary key pattern with that partition key and that sort key, that's how DynamoDB gives you that consistency of performance um, no matter how, how big your, your data gets. Yes, and do you want to talk about index, uh, like the indexes that you have there, or you want to talk about that later? Yeah, sure. I didn't um, um, bring that up too much, but yeah, that's a good point. So uh, we talked a little bit about how um, you know the primary key is really going to drive your access patterns with DynamoDB. That's how you access it. Um, but you know, what if you do have multiple access patterns on an individual type of item, right? You want to be able to access um, uh, maybe a user by the username, but maybe also the user by that email address. How do you enable those? What you can do is create what's called uh, secondary indexes. And what these secondary indexes do, you declare them on your table, and you're basically giving you another primary key for your table that you can perform read-based operations on. So when you write an item into your main table, uh, it's going to look at that item, see if it has the attributes for your secondary index, and if it does, it'll copy that item into that secondary index using those new uh, attributes uh, as the, the primary key there, and then you can read it, you can access it that way. So that user, you know, if you access, if you index it by its username as well, in that secondary index, you could access the user by its username, even though it's not the primary key in yeah, your main I table. Think that's super powerful because maintaining multiple date tables with similar data, it becomes very complex. But this is like transactions that happen in the back, like you don't need to care. So because at the end, I think they are maintained as like they have their own cost, the indexes, like if they were their own table. So they behave like their own thing, but everything gets copied automatically, asynchronous in the back. So whenever you update the main entity, the main table, all the indexes get populated, everything is totally synchronized and I think that's that's one of my favorite features from the indexes because absolutely yeah I mean I, like you're saying like you don't have to maintain that you can rely on uh, these AWS engineers that are that are really good at what they do and they'll handle those copies of data yeah. for you so because copying data in distributed systems can yeah. lead to yeah. a lot of pain 
a lot of failure modes you need to think about that that now you no longer need to think about because AWS is handling exactly. that for you. Yeah. So. So definitely use the indexes. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, so that's what I like. That's just sort of the process of of what you're going to have, right? Understand your application, sort of detail that out. Once you've done that, you list your access patterns, you make that access pattern chart, you make that entity chart, and, and you sort of fill that out by designing your table. And then once that's done, you actually go and implement it in your code, and I think that's what we'll walk through sort of the, the rest of the time, look at some of these these patterns that you might see that are that are pretty common in your code, and, uh, and yeah, I think that'll be... Um, yeah, but I think this process is super important because we tend to not do it that often. Like we just go directly and, oh, let's code. And uh, no. <laughs> yep. yep, exactly. And it's fine to go do some exploratory coding if you want, but at some point, bring it back, standardize that, do all that stuff. And it's also different than a relational database, you know, where relational is sort of abstract from your access patterns. You normalize your data first, and then you think about how am I going to write those SQL queries to access that data. Uh, and it's completely flipped with Dynamo, right? You need to think access patterns first. And once you know those access patterns, you design your table to, to handle those access patterns. Yeah. And one common question I get when I talk about the single table design or, or this concept of really thinking about the access pattern is how do you keep up with applications that keep on growing and changing and migrating and how you do that? Yeah. Yeah. It's a good question. Um, and it really depends on the types of migrations you have. I like to split them into three different buckets. So the first bucket is like existing item types. You're adding new attributes onto those items, right? Like maybe for uh, those users we had before, we didn't used to store a birthday and now we do or something like that. Um, for something like that, if it's not something you're going to access the data by, you can just make that change in your code, right? And it's just like you have a default value if it doesn't exist or, or you allow it to be null. And it's just a code change. You don't have to change anything about existing items in DynamoDB. So that's the first one. That's pretty easy. And, and it's easy because DynamoDB is schemaless other than that primary key. Um, second type you have is when you're adding a new type of entity into your application, right? So, you know, we have all the, these five entities in Instagram, um, but maybe we have maybe want to add a new entity of, of some. I don't know what a new type would be. Like. Reels. Reels, exactly. I don't use Instagram enough to know this <laughs> stuff. But yeah, say we add Reels in, and now we have this new thing. Well, we don't need to change any of our existing data, right? Because Reels didn't exist before. We just need to model that in our application, and going forward, that sort of um, goes. Now, the third part, and this is the hardest part, and this is the one I, I, I think you're talking about, and a lot of people are asking about, is like I have existing data in Dynamo that I need to access in new ways right and that would be like the user if we we weren't allowing them to be accessed by user or by email and now we want to add that pattern later on how do we do that and what you're going to need to do is basically do like an ETL process on your data where you, um, you you'll, you'll perform some sort of background job where you scan your entire table you identify the items that you need to update, in this case, the user items, right? And if you have users and photos and likes all on the same table, you don't need to change photos and likes, but you do need to change users. So you're scanning through your table, you find a user item, and then you just perform an update in place to sort of um, you know, create a new attribute that can be indexed. Once that's all, once all your items are decorated, you know, now you have your secondary index and you can handle that pattern. And it feels hard because you sort of have to manually do it in a way that you didn't have to in relational databases um, but it's also like pretty formulaic once you've done it you know it's, it's that three part scan identify and update and, and i think in in dynamo you get the benefit that you don't need to worry about that background process because i did that for uh, re non-relational databases like uh, what was the name now it's out of well react it was called and we needed to go through all the items but it was hosted so basically we needed to be careful not to put a lot of pain in the system because it could crash so we could not go that fast on the iteration but in dynamo you can basically launch as many like processes as you want and go as fast as you want because yep. it Yep. yep. It's an AWS it, problem. Yeah. It, it, <laughs> Just it's, put your provision up and go for it. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so true. And I and I, like I love how like fully managed Dynamo is where you basically have like one knob you need to turn. Like how many units am I am I having? And other than that, you're Just good to go. And, provision yeah. more and, yep. and let it go. And, yep. and you don't need to worry about anything because yep. I remember when we're doing those migrations in React, it was like, okay, let's leave it running for 27 days. We yeah. were, I was working in the company that was making Angry Birds and our database was one of our databases was that and we had updates on the database all the time for new features and new games and new things and and it was happening that now the whole week there is this react process going <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. don't touch <laughs> oh, 
so okay. Dynamo, I like that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So Dynamo's got a lot of features, makes that easier. Another thing that's cool about Dynamo is they allow you to do what's called a parallel scan on your table. So a scan is going to look at every item in your table. You know, if you have a big table like you do at Rovio, that's going to take a long time to do. But you can actually do a parallel scan where you can put a thousand different workers at it, and Dynamo will do the work to sort of chop up your table into a thousand different sections. They can all be working independently at that and, and make it happen a lot quicker. So it's that's fun. amazing. Yeah. yeah. So it's not a problem anymore to yeah. add those things. So yep, if you need you to migrate your data, you may need some extra work, but you will need extra work in any non-relational database yep. or in relational database as well. Yep. So <laughs> yep. yes. So do you want to show a little bit? of the code now let's do it yeah so again you can check out this repo i'm sure it'll be linked but yeah. um you can do like a proper youtuber it's in the description box yeah yep. <laughs> um okay so here's my my vs code window um so this repo i'm all deploying this with sort of serverless technology so i'm doing serverless framework here so if you want to look there's a serverless.yaml file that it's my infrastructure is code that describes what i'm actually building here you can look through that and it's going to have, um, let's see, it's going to have my functions and I just have a function for sort of each access pattern I have, right? So here's the create user function. Is, here's the path that's going to be at slash users. Here's the method post and here's the handler that will actually run when that happens. Got a bunch of different functions here, maybe, you know, 10 or 15 um, that I'm running through there. And then I also have a resources section. That's where I can provision additional resources using CloudFormation. I'm provisioning my DynamoDB table here. And I have the different attributes, key schema, all that stuff, uh, secondary indexes that I need. Um, probably the last thing I should say is, you know, I need my, my Lambda functions will need some uh, permissions to access that table. So I have IAM role statements up here that give, you know, uh, get item, put item, query, update item, all the stuff that I'm going to need um, on my DynamoDB items. Um, so I'm er, giving that access to my Lambda functions. Here we go um, from lines 102 down here um, has this. So it's got my type, which is going to be um, just an AWS DynamoDB table. Uh, again, you need to declare that primary key on your table in DynamoDB, and the way you do that is through this key schema attribute, and I'm using a composite primary key that has two elements. So the first element, uh, the attribute name is PK, and the key type is hash, which is another name for that partition key. Um, and then I That's also always have, so confusing that I one know. is hash and range, and in Dynamo is partition and sort. I know. That's that's my least favorite thing. I wish we could we could change that, but it'd break too many people's things at this point. So, uh, and then yeah, so then I also have the sort key, which is the range. As part of that, when, whenever you have an attribute in DynamoDB, you need to declare the type of that attribute as well. And it could be a string, it could be a number, it could be binary, it could also be complex things like lists or sets or maps. Um, so whenever you're sort of declaring an attribute in Dynamo, you need to have that. So that's what we also have up here in our attribute definitions. So you can see up here, I have PK and SK for those two attributes, and they're both attribute type of S, which is for a string. So I'm just saying my primary key is going to have a partition key of PK, which is a string, and a sort key uh, named SK, which is also a string. So that's what those are right there. Uh, and the and good thing that you don't need to define any of the other attributes because exactly. it's a schema less. So you only define the ones that you are kind of mentioning. So yep, like exactly. this. Exactly. Yep. And then, um, and then I also needed a, a single secondary index on that. So I have this global secondary indexes section. I give it an index name of, of GSI one, and then you just have to declare the key schema of that. Just exactly similar to the, the key schema on my main table, but this is going to be for your secondary index. So here I'm using that same pattern of, of you know, GSI one PK, GSI one SK. And then because I'm declaring those here, I also need to declare them in my attribute definitions up there. Um, last thing here, I'm using billing mode pay per request. So DynamoDB has two different billing modes. Uh, the, the traditional one is provision capacity where you say, um, this is how many read units and this is how many write units I want. They're going to be provisioned for you ahead of time. They're going to be available per second. Uh, um, every single second you can use consume that much from your table. 
the second mode, which is the newer mode, it's it's on demand or pay per request where you don't need to provision anything up front in advance. You can you can just say, hey, pay me, bill me for every single request I make against my table. You know, when a read unit when a read comes in, they'll see how many units it consumes and charge you accordingly for that. Same thing with writes, and and you don't really need to worry about it at all, which is which is really nice, um, just in terms of like the time you're going to save on capacity planning. But also, um, so paper request is going to be more than provision capacity on like a fully utilized basis. But uh, I find that people, in, in myself included, are, are really bad at fully utilizing their DynamoDB table. You know, you have you have peaks and, and flows during the day, during the week, during the month, things like Unless that. Unless you have something very stable, yeah. then yeah, absolutely. I think once way I have seen it, some, some customers use it, is that they do paper requests for a while and they understand what is the usage. And if they find these tables that are very predictable, then they provision concurrency. But if not, they stay on the kind of paper requests. Uh, but I think paper request is so much easier. <laughs> it, it is. It's so nice. And and the advice I give to people is like use paper request until your bill is is actually meaningful. Because you know if you're spending less than a hundred dollars a month on Dynamo, it's not worth the uh, hours of engineering time to to figure out how to right size that or or scale up and down things like like just send it on paper request and wait till that bill is meaningful and then see if you can optimize it. Optimize, yeah. So. Um, so yeah, I think that's, um, that's good. So the... now we have this table. <laughs> yep. So that's, that's how we have our table. And then, you know, if you're using serverless, I already deployed this application, but if you run SLS deploy, it'll deploy all this. So, uh, what this is going to do with, with serverless framework, it's going to be similar to Sam, if you've used that, but, uh, it'll create all your different individual Lambda functions. It'll package up those zip files, upload them to S3. Then it'll, you know, register your Lambda functions. It'll register the endpoints. It'll create my DynamoDB table, set up the IAM permissions, all that stuff for you in a nice repeatable way. So even though I already deployed this, I can run it again and, and deploy it and um, it'll only change what changed, which, which should be nothing since the last time. But um, so yeah, it's pretty nice that way. So definitely recommend using some sort of infrastructure as code tool to, to handle this sort of thing. And you can also see now that I've got this deployed, here are all my endpoints and, and things like that um, for, my, for my application that I have, the different functions, all that stuff. So yeah, they want to create a user to show us how that works. Yeah, absolutely. So let me. So I'll pop over into Insomnia here. I'm going to, and I've got just a bunch of endpoints to find. I need to update my environment real quick. Yes. So you Put point to the right. <laughs> URL done. Okay. So now I have a bunch of different endpoints here that I can test this stuff. A create user endpoint. I have my base URL uh, slash users. I'm going to send a post request to that. So I have username of Alex Debris name of Alex Debris, I'll send that one up. And hey, it worked and it, it sends that user back. Um, you know, I got the username and name. It also shows like my follower count and following count, right? Which is which is none right now, but as we start to follow users later on, that count will change, things like that. Uh, let's also, just so we have two users to play with. Let's, so let's create. We can user. follow each other. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, let's send that one up. All right, so now we have two yeah. users in there. If I also want to get a particular user, I have a get user one, right? And it's just going to have um, user slash and then the username. So I can send that back, send that up. And I got that user. If I want to change it to Marcia, I can do that as well. And there we go. So we have our post and, and get user um, endpoints working. Uh, should we hop over and check out sort of the code for, for that yes. stuff and how that's working? Because I think a lot of the magic now is happening in the code. Because yep. this database that you created is very abstract. It could hold anything. Yep, absolutely. <laughs> so um, a couple things I want to um, talk about first, just in terms of like how we model some of this stuff, right? So we talked earlier about how you list out your access patterns and then you design your table. And as part of designing your table, you have that entity chart that says, hey, for a user item, here's the PK, here's the SK. For that photo item, here's the PK, here's the SK, all that sort of stuff. In terms of how I sort of set that up, I go to source data and I have this base, I'm using TypeScript here, I have a base.ts file. And I have this, this abstract class that I call item, which just defines a few things that, that needed to get declared on every um, entity that's gonna subclass this item. So I have two abstract getters, um, PK and SK, right? That return a string. So 
each item or each specific entity that subclasses this item class needs to de declare the PK and SK, which defines that PK and SK pattern um, for that sort of thing. I also have um, a keys property that's going to return uh, the PK and SK because it's pretty common to use um, the keys in, in some of these different operations. If you're doing a get item, an update item, a delete item, you need to have those keys. So it's nice to have a, a method defined on that. And then I also have this um, additional um, method called to item where if I'm saving this this item to the database I want to have this method I could call that says hey just turn this into a DynamoDB item so that I can actually um, save it to the database and I don't like you know in my application code I don't need to think about it it's just going to be contained in that um, that actual entity yeah class I think that's that makes life easier to to abstract everything out so you don't have dynamo jumping all around your code <laughs> yeah yep, exactly I like to keep um, that, that's a great point of like you don't have dynamo all around your code like I like to keep some of the dynamo stuff like right this PK SK we talked about indexing attributes and application attributes earlier and like keep the indexing attributes totally away from the rest of your application because your application shouldn't think about that uh, your application should be thinking about um, you know the application attributes so keep that within your classes and, and not sort of leaking into your your business logic things like yeah. that and what about the operations that you're doing on these uh, classes I imagine you also have them hidden like abstracted out Yep, yep. So let's move into like one implementation. So in my data folder, I have like a user.ts file. Um, and first thing I do is I'll just like implement a class user that extends that item, right? And I say the different properties I'm going to have on it. I have my constructor, things like that. Um, but you can also see I have my PK and SK getters here. And what I'm doing is just returning that string that I have from my entity chart so I go to my entity chart and I just say hey what do I need to make that string look like and I go implement it here and that's that's what I'm talking about with Dynamo where like once you've done the modeling the implementation is very easy you're gonna have this SK in PK for every single one pretty easy to do um, I also talked about that two item method here right and basically I'm saying hey put the keys in there but then also have um, the username the name the following count things like that um, some of this is 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 funky DynamoDB syntax so <laughs> yeah <laughs> just just an ex explanation of what's going on here um, every attribute they put in Dynamo has to be typed right that's the string number binary things like that and you need to specify that type so what I'm doing here is for this username value I'm saying I'm pushing up a map that says hey this is a string type attribute type s and the value is going to be username same thing with the the name here whereas the follower count and the following count that's actually a number attribute so then the the type there is n for number and i'm putting uh, this value up there all the actual actually attribute values that you send up have to be a string so that's why i'm changing this to a string um, but i'm indicating that's a number value yeah, by sending up that yeah but dynamo needs to know that so that's what we have there. One last thing I want to talk about that I often implement on each of my methods is um, like a from item method that uh, it'll base it's, it's like a class method that'll you know you when you get an item back from DynamoDB you can call this on it and it's going to return an instance of the class for you. Oh, nice. So it basically, just like parses that out and and returns a new user item. We'll see how that um, it, you know because it, what it's doing is parsing out the username string value right here or it's parsing out the follower count number value and converting it to a number so it's doing all that yeah. conversion for you so again you only have to do that in one place um, so we'll have a class like that for sort of every single entity we have and then I, I also just like implement my different patterns on top of those entities uh, you can have it in a different uh, file like a service file or something like that I just put it in the same one here but so here I have a create user method which is one of our our key methods we're gonna have here hmm. um, where you pass in a user item and we'll actually just save it to Dynamo. Um, so what it's going to do is um, call put item, which is how you insert an item into DynamoDB. The item you want to put here, you can just call that user dot two item. So again, it's just it's doing all that conversion for you. That's all encapsulated in the class. You don't really need to think about it. Um, and the last thing I have here that you're going to use quite often is a condition expression. Um, and what a condition expression is when you're using DynamoDB anytime you do a write operation so whether you're inserting an item updating an item deleting an item if you're doing something that changes state in dynamo you can have a condition expression that's evaluated before that write and basically mm. that if that evaluates to uh, false then it'll cancel that write and, and it won't happen this can this can you know prevent you from having bad data in certain ways or, or doing things you don't want to so in this case what I'm doing is I'm saying 
um, it, it's saying attribute not exists PK. So an attribute that doesn't exist that has that same PK uh, value. Uh, and this is just preventing me from overwriting an existing item. So if I'm creating a user, with a particular username, you know, someone says, hey, create a user Alex Debris, I want to make sure there's not already an existing user with Alex Debris, because otherwise it would um, just overwrite that user and, and delete their data, exactly. so we don't want to do that. So um, this is going to be a very common thing that you do, is have that condition expression um, that makes sure... But that's a great thing, because you it's not that you need to go to database and check if the user exists and then come back, because if you do that, it, in the meantime, maybe if the fun first function, it tells you that it doesn't exist, maybe somebody else created it. So in this way, it's more atomic and yeah. everything happens within absolutely. Dynamo. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So it's, yeah, two things. I mean, it's it's atomic. You don't have the race condition stuff. And also it's it's faster because you don't have to make one request, yeah. come back, look at it, make exactly. another request. Like it's, it's great. And you can do this, you know, I'd say a common one is going to be around uniqueness. So this is a very common pattern, but you can also do this to make sure, um, you know, if you have like a bank account balance or inventory count and you make a sale, you want to make sure it doesn't go below zero. So you, you can, um, you know, if someone's making a charge in their bank account, you can make sure it doesn't go be below zero before accepting that charge to happen. Or, or if you're accepting an order, you can make sure the inventory doesn't go below zero, things like that. Um, that can help you with your, your logic there. That's one that's, question. Oh yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, I have a couple of questions. First yeah, one, sure. what is that get client that you have there? Get client. That's a great question. Let's, let's skip to this. And what I have is in my data, I have a client.ts file and it's just a little function that is going to return a dynamo DB client for me. And, and I like to do this for, for two different reasons. Number one, when I'm creating this Dynamo DB client, as you can see right here, there are certain parameters I might want to put in there to configure that client. So I have, uh, in this case, what I have is like in my HTTP options, I'm setting some timeouts, right? Like both a connect timeout and a request timeout um, to be a, a thousand milliseconds, so one second. And what I'm doing is just cutting that off if there is some sort of connection timeout. And uh, you know, in this particular case, I, I think the default timeouts are like 30 seconds. So occasionally you just what? have a request hanged. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It, it's, it's crazy. Like this is like the most common thing that I, I see people have issues with, like in Lambda and things like that, is they'll have a function timeout and they have no reason, why, no idea yeah. why. Yeah, or, or your API gateway timing out yeah. first and you're like, why? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and you just like have no visibility. And it's almost always just like, a, a, you know, request gets dropped in certain places. You put this in there and I think it'll just retry it automatically if it does hit that timeout. So so put those things in there but what you can do is like configure your client with these things HTTP options happens to be one thing but there's a lot of configuration you can put into your client and this way you don't have to do it in every single uh, class right every time you're getting a client you don't have to do that um, you can just do it in one place which is really nice so that's one reason I do this the other reason uh, if you look at this is like outside of this function I'm, I'm like setting this client equal to null and um, and then what I'm doing is within my function, you know, if the client exists, return the client, otherwise um, set the client to this new client and return it. And what that does is it, it like caches my client. It makes it like a singleton there. Um, and so especially if you have like a Lambda function, the first time you make that request to DynamoDB, you know, Dynamo is using an HTTP connection thing, but um, the first time it does that, it has to do the TLS handshake and, and set up that HTTP connection. But then if you reuse that same client, it already has that connection initialized. You don't have to redo that handshake and, and it can be much quicker to do that. So this first request might take 80 milliseconds, 100 milliseconds because it has to do that, that three-way handshake. Yeah. But then subsequent requests might take six or 10 milliseconds. So this is just caching that client for you um, so you don't have to think about that. Yeah, and I have another question, and I think this is a question that I get asked a lot. How you test this? Can you test this locally? Can you mock somehow all these things that you are building, or you will not recommend it? Yeah, um, and are you talking about like this sort of client spe stuff no, specific? No, just Dynamo DB. Because now you have, for example, the create user. You want to make sure that it's working before putting it to the cloud. And I have my visions here, my, my, my perspective, but I want to get yours yep. until what point you test locally and until what point you test in the cloud or do you clone the cloud in your computer? How, how, how you recommend it? To do? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. And I'm not very dogmatic on this one. Um, I realize different people like different things. I'd say if your application is pretty simple and straightforward, I think it's okay to test locally. And when I say that, um, I would say if it's API gateway, 
Lambda and Dynamo DB. I think those are all the tooling around running those locally is is pretty good. You can use Dynamo DB local, which emulates Dynamo DB really well. Um, it's also very easy to like sort of configure your client here to send it to local hosts, things like that. That's so, what I was telling you when yeah. I saw the client. It's just like mm. <laughs> yeah. so you could have an environment variable where like if you know process.m.test equals true, um, then set the endpoint to localhost 800, and that would send it back with your client. And again, you don't need to set that anywhere else, which is which is really nice. Um, so again, like API Gateway, Lambda, and Dynamo are, are pretty easy if you're doing those locally. If you start adding in other parts to your application, which I almost always do, SQS, event bridge, step functions, Kinesis, all those things, a lot harder to test locally uh, or emulate locally. I think the tooling around that isn't as good. And at that point, what I would say is is test in the cloud. And the nice thing about having, uh, you know, uh, infrastructure as code, whether it's serverless YAML, SAM, whatever you're doing, is it's very easy to like spin up your whole application and what you can do is you can have your production application, you can have your staging application, but also you as a developer can can spin up your entire, you can deploy your entire application to another AWS account um, and have a pretty high fidelity look at what your application looks like and test it that way. And, and it's quick to do so. It's, it's generally cheap to do so, especially if you're using serverless friendly um, tools. So API Gateway, DynamoDB, Lambda, SQS, those are basically all pay-per-use type things, and you're not going to be using it enough on your dev stage to where it's going to cost you anything. I mean, you can have a, a basically high fidelity look at your production environment that costs you less than a dollar a month because you're just not using it very much. Um, so, I, I think that's that's awesome, and and so I would re like, I recommend people test in the cloud and just get used to having that sort of workflow. Um, but you know, if you do, if you really like to test locally and you have a simple enough application, I think you can test locally if you want to. Is, yeah, is and I think one, one, one thing I will, I will add is to do unit tests, and then you can test locally in a safe way without touching the cloud because unit tests don't need internet, and then go to cloud and do your other testing because I think people like to debug in the, like locally, that's basically what they're doing when they're testing locally is trying things manually. Just add unit tests, make sure all the JSONs that you're sending to Dynamo make sense. Yep. <laughs> and with that class model that you have built, it's quite simple to build those unit tests around yep. it. So I'll let you continue now. <laughs> cool. Yeah. So, um, yeah, just a couple things we covered so far. Number one, like having that base class that has those those abstract PKSK, that get client that we talked about, I think is going to be useful, especially if you're running in Lambda to where you can cache that client and, and things like that. And then using condition expressions to prevent overwrites. Um, the next pattern I want to talk about, this is kind of a fun one. Um, often in your, in your application, you have needs, um, access patterns with sort of two needs. And I would say you have entities that need a unique ID. So like a UUID, but you also want some sorting particular around like creation date when that item was created and, and how can you do that? Right? Cause UUIDs aren't sortable by themselves, but you can use something that's called a ULID. So here I'm importing the ULID library and you can go check this out. There are ULIDs implementations for like almost every language out there, or at least like the major languages. Um, and what a ULID is, it's basically got the uniqueness of a UUID, but it's it's prefixed with the timestamp at when it was created. So um, that you that ULID will, will be prefixed with that timestamp. Now within your DynamoDB, you know, we talked about partitions and then within that partition, it's sorted according to that sort key. They'll be sorted in creation order date there. So you get nice ordering um, from that ULID. So, if I, I will use, use this from now on because I hate my UIIDs that are random. And yeah. then it's like, I want to know which one is the last one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. It's, 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 it's awesome. There are, there are like a couple of different types of implementations. So there's ULID, which is pretty popular. There's also one called KSUID, which came from the folks at Segment um, a few years back. But like, if you want a sortable, unique ID, uh, it's really nice that you can get basically like both of those in, in one, in one thing there. So, um, awesome. use UI IDs as those. I'll, I'll, I'll show like a quick example of how that works too. Let me go back to insomnia. I, I don't think I've implemented list photo, which I should have, but I'll, okay. I'll, I did it for likes. So let's get back okay. to insomnia and maybe let's create a photo and then like a photo a few different times too. So, um, here I have 
a create photo access pattern where I'm just posting to you know a particular user photo and I'm, I'm sending up the URL where that photo exists because I probably up, uploaded it client side something like that so I hit send uh, and now I have this this photo in my in the cloud here let's get that ID and now it's like that photo so so now my um, this access pattern is for this particular photo. If you post to the likes endpoint, you can you can actually like it. Uh, as part of that body, we're setting up the liking username. That's just because I didn't implement auth. In, in actuality, you would probably pull that from auth, which username that was. But yeah, we're setting that up. Okay. Yeah. So Marcia, like my photo. Here we go. Oh, that got that got implemented there. If you look at these IDs, these are each KSU IDs here. So you can see what that sort or not KSU IDs, sorry, UL IDs. You can see what that looks like. So if you look at this, the first, you know, six or eight characters, that's actually going to be the timestamp in there. And then the rest of that is just going to be some random values um, that gives you your, your uniqueness. I'm also going to like cool. this again with Alex Debris. You're liking your own photos. I, you know, I'm vain. I gotta, I gotta pump those likes up there, right? So and get that. Um, but now let me copy that, and we'll go to actually. So we'll go to list likes for photos, right? Where we want to get all the the likes for a particular photo. I posted that that photo ID in there, sent that back, um, and you can see it's ordered in sort of most recent to, to least recent here. So I have, that's nice. Here's uh, Alex Debris who liked it second and then uh, Marcia who liked it um, first. So you, you can see like, Hey, who's liking this most recently. So, you know, if you look at Instagram or Twitter or things like that. That's probably uh, similar ish to how they're, they're implementing something like this. That's super cool. Cool. Um, last thing I want to show, and then um, we'll hop back into the code here and show both how that sort of, sorting stuff works, how those queries work, but also how do we doing how we're doing likes. I'm gonna retrieve that photo back. Uh, so I did a get on that particular photo. It returned that photo item. Here's the owning user, the URL, the photo ID. Notice how it has a likes count and a comment count, right? So now I have the likes count of two because you know I liked it, Marcia liked it. Um, uh, it's good to uh, it's got those two likes on it. So we'll see how to implement that sort of thing here. Uh, in a second, so I'll switch back to VS Code for that. Uh, because that's a common use on pattern when you want to count things. Yep. Yeah. Often when you have sort of a, a relationship, you know, a, a one to many or a many to many relationship, on that parent item, you often want to maintain like a reference count to show how that is. And it's not very efficient to sort of grab that every time like you know read all the likes every time and, and say oh now it's five now it's ten rather just like maintain that counter as you go is 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 a better way to handle that usually so you can see on my photo item here I have both a likes count and a comment count that I'm going to initialize to zero when we get started um, and now let's look at the like and see what we're doing there oops like Okay, so I have an access pattern called like photo, um, and what I'm going to do is execute a transaction operation. And what a DynamoDB transaction does is it allows you to um, do multiple write operations in a single request, and those operations will, will succeed or fail together. So if one of those operations fails, the entire operation fails. It rolls back all those other changes, and it's a nice way to, you know, like a transaction in a relational database, do a bunch of operations together and make sure that they, they all succeed. Um, so in this particular operation, we're going to do two, in this transaction, we're going to do two operations. Number one, we'll do an insert of that actual like, right? So we're saying uh, Marcia is liking this particular photo. And, and just like we did that put item with uh, the user, we're going to do that same thing here. You'll also notice we have a condition expression here, same sort of condition expression. We want to make sure Marcia didn't already like this photo because we don't want her just sort of pumping the like counts on my photos, things like that. We, one like per per user here, so we're making sure um, that that and doesn't And if that one exist. fails, the whole thing fails. Exactly, yep. So if Marcia already liked this, we're not going to do anything else. This will fail and we'll, and we'll roll it back. Um, in addition, that second operation we're going to do is an update operation, and this is going to be on the photo. So we're, we're saying which item is it. We're using the key to do that. We're doing that photo, and that's where that dot keys method comes in earlier to identify which photo we want to do. And what we're doing is we're setting an update operation where we're incrementing the likes count. So uh, just th this looks kind of funky, but we'll walk through it here. What we're doing is setting the likes count attribute equal to 
the likes count, the current value of the likes count plus an increment value. So let's go look at this. Um, so this hash likes count, what that doing is, this is an expression attribute name here and it's actually saying uh, it's it's the value of this, it's the name of this is, is the likes count there. Um, and then this colon increment is saying we want to increment this value by one. Um, so when you have these update expressions, you'll need you'll also have these expression attribute names and values, which is sort of substitute um, names and values in there. But yeah, that's what's going on here is, is we're just incrementing the value yeah. of that length. That's count. always confusing so, when you see it for the first time. Yeah. But after a while, you you learn yeah. how, how it yeah. works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and pretty, yeah. I don't want to get into it here because it's like so confusing. But yeah, it is it is weird to see what that looks like for sure. But basically what we're doing there is incrementing that likes count. So we want those two operations to sort of succeed together. And another thing we're doing, you know, on that update is we're making sure um, in this condition expression, when we're updating the photo, we want to say, make sure this attribute exists. So we want to make sure this photo actually exists because we don't want Marcia to, to like some, you know, photo that doesn't exist. So again, same thing. If that photo doesn't exist, this will fail. We won't put that like item in there and, and, and we'll just move on. So those will all those will both go together in this particular operation um, as we go and that's a, that's, yeah, that's a very common handy. pattern yeah using that that transaction with with reference counts like that because handling that kind of atomicity if not it's very complicated because yeah. imagine if i'm liking the photo and at the same time you're deleting it then there will be a like in some word that it doesn't have a parent um in this case it's no, yeah. <laughs> it cannot yeah. happen. Yeah, and yeah, if you're doing multiple operations and you have to like roll it back with like a SAGA pattern, it's like it's just, it's hard. Yeah, so it's nice to be able to do that in transactions. And transactions are actually fairly new in Dynamo. I think that was 2018 or 2019 reInvent. Um, but yeah, huge, like that just simplified a ton of things uh, being able to do And that. in this case, everything is in the same table, but you can do it in multiple different tables. Yep. So Yep, absolutely, great point. So um, next one I want to do and this is following up on something we did, right? Listing the likes for a photo. So when we were retrieving those likes back, how do we how do we get those out of there? Um, what you're going to use there is a query operation. So um, a query operation is is sort of like a it, it's a list based operation. It's a read operation on Dynamo where you can read multiple items that have the same partition key. And we talked about that earlier. Partition key items are grouped together and then they're sorted according to that sort key. Query is how you efficiently get that. And that's what we're doing here. Um, we're actually using our secondary index in this one. Uh, and then you just have to specify what's called a key condition expression that says, hey, which which item is I looking for? You have to specify the partition key you're looking for. And then you can also specify conditions on the sort key if you want to. Um, I didn't have to here, but I'm basically just saying, hey, I want the GSI 1PK value to be equal to the GSI 1PK for this like. Uh, I'm also saying scan index forward equals false, which means like sort of go reverse order here, and that's going to give me um, reverse chronological. I want the most recent likes first, um, and then the older likes um, later. And yeah, and so queries are very powerful. So yeah. I think if if you're learning Dynamo, definitely go and check what you can do with queries because you can like bring if, now that you sorted everything by time, you can bring the latest uh, five I don't know comments or something like that. You can do I don't know really a lot of operations on and even do a little search if you want. Like uh, if it begins with like some characters, you can bring those things that are in the sort key. So I think uh, it's quite powerful what you can do with that uh, expression. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Query's huge. Like the great thing about it is, you know, with Dynamo, that primary key is so important, but sometimes you only know part of the primary key, right? Like if you're, if you want to pull somebody's orders, you don't know what, what the order ID was. You just exactly know the not. sort of username and you just say, hey, give me all the orders for this username. Like you said, it's it's sorted chronologically. You can you can get the most recent ones first and uh, and you're good to go there. So it works it works really well. So that's cool. Yeah, I think this is something super important for people to, to learn. Um cool. One more pattern I want to I want to show off, and this is about many to many relationships and, and how to handle some of those things. So um actually let's let's hop back and do a quick one in um insomnia again. So let's follow somebody, right? So 
we have um, a follow endpoint. I want to follow particular people. It, it's going to affect what shows up in my timeline, things like that. You know, if you're familiar with Instagram, Twitter, any of that stuff. So let's follow someone. Uh, let's say Alex. Let's say Marcia wants to follow me. So we're sending that one up here, and you can see we've added this follow in here. And now it's saying uh, Marcia is following Alex Debris. We have two access patterns based on that, right? We want to find all the followers. Um, of a user. So if I want to see, hey, who is following me, I can go look at that. And I can also say, hey, look at all the followed by for a user. So who are all the people that, that Marcia is following, right? So uh, list followers for user, let's do that one real quick. And you can see that I have my my one follower here. And the nice thing here is that it has all the information about Marcia. It's got her whole user object. It has her username, her name, her follower count, following count, things like that. Um, so all that there, we're going to see in a second how we how we do that. Uh, same thing if we want to do the followed by a user, we're going to fi find all the people that uh, Marcia is following. And we can oh, see I'm that. following you. There we go. Wait, did I do that wrong? Oh yeah, there we go. No, yeah, yeah, there we go. That's right. Okay, so there's uh, there's me in there. So um, often, like this is a many to many relationship, right? Like I can uh, follow many people. I can also be followed by many people, and it's not bi-directional. Like those can be distinct. So uh, many to many relationship. Let's see how we implement this one because this is a little trickier. Yeah, but that's a very common use use case now in social media. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so the thing about our follow record is it's going to be like a very bare bones record. It's it's sort of just like a bi-directional pointer to um, to the two people involved, but I don't duplicate all the information about the user onto that follow record because it's so mutable, right? Like if we looked at that user that came back, it had a username, which isn't going to change, but maybe, you know, maybe you change your name and have a different display name, maybe you, and, and also like your follower and following count is going to be changing all the time. So it's hard to denormalize, duplicate that data onto each follow relationship. So the follow is going to be very bare bones, just point to it, point to the two users. And then if we want to, oh yeah, here's a transaction for that follow user. If you want to look in that, I'll, I'll just quickly do it. And, and we're going to insert that, that follow in there again, making sure it doesn't already exist because you can't follow someone more than once. But then we also have two update operations where we want to update the follower count of the person being followed. We want to update the following count of the person that's following. So we have three operations in this transaction. If any of them uh, fails, it's going to roll it back and, and the follow won't happen. And then, but it's going to update all those counts for us, which is, which is really nice. Um, so there's that. Let's move into like those, those list based operations. How do we do this? Uh, and it's going to be a two step process here. So list the followers of a user. Um, first we'll run this query operation. So exactly what we were doing before, get that query operation, which I only know part of the, the, the key, right? I, I want to know the followers of Alex Debris or the followers of Marcia. I can put that in there and get all those followers. And now I have those follows back. Once I have those follow items, those items point to the person on the other end of that relationship. And we'll come down here. Uh, we'll create keys out of those. Don't need to know about that too much. But we'll run a batch get item operation, which says, hey, I have 10 users that are following me, right? And I want to go sort of enrich all the information about that user. I want to get their display name. I want to get their following count, all that stuff. I'll go do a batch get item to retrieve each of those individual items from the DynamoDB table. I can get up to... I can't remember if it's 25 or 100 in a single operation using this batch get item request and I just get all those at once, they come back to me and then I map over those and return those users. And that's how I go from here are those followers that are just pointing to those people to actually enriching each of those items and, and sending them back in that response. Yeah, and that's more efficient than doing a query for each user, like iterating over the yep. list and doing yep. the query. Yep. Exactly, yeah, you can just go straight to it and get exactly what you want there. I think a lesson learned from your talk is learn, look at the Dynamo documentation and information. There's so much, many things that are coming through Dynamo that you don't need to reinvent the wheel. <laughs> yep. Yep. Yeah. It's like the great thing about Dynamo is, um, you know, you, you need to learn like two or three key concepts about how they organize data, how you need to think about data. Once you sort of grok those, then it's like, you learn five to 10 to 15 patterns, not a ton of patterns. Yeah. Like these five we talked about here are the most common ones by a long shot. You learn those and it's just like, oh, you just re-implement those over and over. It's just like this very 
uh, basic building block that can allow you to, to implement all these different patterns. And again, it's going to give you that consistent performance as you scale and, and it's exactly. really nice. Yeah. So that's super cool. That's all I have for the yeah. core, I think. So. Yeah, but that's really cool. And I think this was super educational for everybody watching because uh, I learned a lot of things and I'm pretty sure everybody else uh, did learn. But if they want to learn more, I recommend Alex's book uh, that is like mind blowing uh, into Dynamo and learning all the secrets and what, what you can do. So I will leave the link in the description box for people to go and check check your book. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. And, and thanks yeah. for having me on. This was, this was uh, really fun, you know, long time yeah. watcher for sure, and, and fun to, to hop on and, and actually do this. So, yeah, it's always a pleasure to, to have a chat with you. So, I hope to see you next year in Rain Band. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah, we'll all be there. So, <laughs> we'll all be there, I yep. hope. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. Yep. Yeah, and all the links for the GitHub repo and, and, and all the links for finding Alex are in the description box. So, they can go and ask you more questions and Learn more from Dynamo. So, sounds great. <laughs> oh, Dynamo. So, yeah. So, thank you very much, Alex, for your time and for making this demo. I think everybody really appreciates always to see code and see things in practice because it's so much easier than to see just slides. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Glad to do it. Yes. Have a great day. Thank ciao, you. Ciao. You too. Thanks, Marcia. Thank you for watching the episode until the end. All the links that we mentioned and the GitHub repo and how to find Alex in the internet are in the description box. And I see you next week in another episode of Uwa.